Hi, in this lesson, we're going to get into the Arizona Residential Landlord and Tenant Act. And you know, there's a sign, this is an actual sign written in a residential unit. It says, there will be no loud noisy in room or hallway. It is the law. The police will be called. You and your guests will be in their hands. The landlord. All right, so watch out. Don't rent a place there. So what's the Arizona Residential Landlord and Tenant Act all about? Well, first of all, the name tells you that it deals with residential property, not commercial property. And there are some specific exemptions to the law. Let's take a look at what the law does not apply to. It doesn't apply to commercial properties, to non-residential properties. It also does not apply to hotels and motels. These are transient type dwellings, so hotels and motels fall under a totally separate set of laws. It also doesn't apply to religious service housing, such as convents and rectories. How about school dormitories? Nope. Uh, properties that are owned, dormitories that are owned by the university or the private high school and so on, those are not regulated by the Landlord Tenant Act. And finally, public housing. Now, by public housing, I mean housing that is owned by the government. I'm not talking here about Section 8 housing, which is private housing, but where the tenant might qualify for a rent subsidy. We're talking about public housing. Housing owned by the city or another government entity would not be regulated by the Landlord Tenant Act. In the Arizona Landlord Tenant Act, there are specific provisions preventing discriminations against families with children. Of course, unless there is a valid deed restriction. And for more information on this, you can refer to the lesson that we've had here in this course on fair housing. So let's talk about the obligations that a landlord has, and then we'll look at the tenant's obligations. First, let's talk about security deposits. The landlord cannot require the tenant to pay more than one and a half times the first month's rent, either delineated as a security deposit or as prepaid rent. So for example, let's say we had a $1,000 monthly rent. That, that first month's rent, let's say it's paid on the first of the month, would be $1,000. The maximum security deposit would be one and a half times that or $1,500. Now, that includes, that includes any prepaid rent, any additional prepaid rent. So the most the landlord could require the tenant to pay in that example would be the $1,000. That's the first month's rent paid in advance, plus the $1,500, no matter how it's delineated. Now, if a tenant wants to voluntarily pay more than that uh, in advance, they can do that, but the landlord cannot require that. Also, any the items that are stated as a deposit are considered to be refundable unless they are specifically stated as non-refundable. So a landlord, if they want to make sure that certain deposits are non-refundable, should specify that they are non-refundable. Otherwise, they are refundable. At termination of the lease, of course, the tenant's going to want to get their security deposit back. But what if they've done damage to the property? Well, first of all, when they first moved in, the landlord and tenant should have gone through and gone through a checklist as to what damage the property might have already had. Kind of like renting a car. When you rent a car, you want to walk around the car and mark off the areas where there are dings or dents uh, in the fenders or whatever. Well, the same thing should be done at least inception. And then at least termination, prior to that, the tenant and the landlord should do the same thing to see if there's any additional damage. Oftentimes there is, or sometimes the tenant leaves the property not having to gone through a check. The tenant oftentimes wants their security deposit back. Well, let's take a look at what your course material says here. It says here that to apply security deposits to damage and or rent, the landlord, upon demand of the tenant, in other words, the tenant has to ask for it, must deliver the tenant an itemized written statement of amounts due within 14 business days of the termination of the tenancy. Now what that is saying is that if the tenant demands it, the landlord has to give them this, 14, this letter within 14 days, this accounting. 
but if the tenant doesn't demand it, the landlord really doesn't have to do it. However, smart landlords and all property management companies that I know make this a regular practice. So when a tenant moves out, they go through the property with them, hopefully. Uh, and either way, if there's some money that's going to be retained by the landlord, the landlord gives them this itemized accounting of what the security deposit would be used for. So smart business is to always do it, whether or not the tenant asks for it. Now, if the landlord fails to, to supply that after the tenant asks for it, as your material says, the landlord could be subject to two times the amount of the security deposit as damages if they don't comply. So in theory, then, the tenant could get their security deposit back plus two times the security deposit as damages if they went to court and the court found the landlord at fault. So this is an interesting area. Security, you know, there's always a, a lot of give and take and a lot of pull and push between landlords and tenants. But the Landlord-Tenant Act is rather clear in this specific issue. Now, separate fees, separate fees other than deposits are okay. In other words, you can specify there's going to be a $300 cleaning fee or there's going to be a $200 or whatever the dollar amount is fee uh, for your pet. And these can be required, again, above the security deposit, but they've got to be called a fee not a deposit. Now, the landlord has to disclose who the manager is, if there is a manager, who the owner is or the owner's agent, oftentimes a property management company. They also have to disclose and state in the lease that there's a copy of the Landlord Tenant Act that we're talking about here is available through the Arizona Department of Housing. The landlord has to comply with health, safety, and building codes. That's common sense. The landlord has to keep the premises fit, habitable, and safe. The landlord has to provide trash receptacles and provisions for trash removal. The one exception to this is in single-family rentals. Single-family rentals, you don't have to provide the trash receptacle or provisions for removal. You have to provide, the landlord has to provide basic necessities like hot and cold running water and air conditioning or heat when the seasons demand it. How about tenant obligations? Well, a tenant is required to use the premises in a safe manner, to keep it clean, to use equipment reasonably. Also, no deliberate destruction of the property. That may seem obvious, but the law specifies that. And not disturb any of the neighbors. If you're in a multi-unit development, obviously those other tenants have the right of quiet enjoyment. So no heavy metal after about, well, no heavy metal period, and to follow rules. Pretty straightforward obligations. One of the common problems between tenants and landlords is the landlord entering the premises or disturbing the tenant at any time the landlord feels like they'd like to. You know, some landlords feel that this property is mine and I can go in and out of there anytime I like. Well, not so. What the law allows the tenant to do is require the landlord, if the tenant chooses, to give the tenant at least two days notice, two days written notice to enter the premises, except in the case of emergencies. Let's say that I knock on your door and I say, hey, Joey, how you doing? You know, we're checking out all the apartments to see if uh, they need to be painted this season. Do you mind if I come in? And you say, sure, Jim, come on in. Well, uh, you've allowed me to enter the premises. I haven't had to give you any notice. But what if uh, instead of saying that, you know, uh, Jim, uh, you know, I'm kind of busy right now and uh, I'd like you to come back at another time. I tell you what, I'm going to give you two days. You can come back two days from now and then you can take a look at the property. So it's only if the tenant demands it, if the tenant requires it. And in real estate, a lot of times actually tenants do require this, especially if they're in a rental house and the owner wants to put the house up for sale, the tenant, of course, doesn't want to be disturbed, and it makes it very difficult for the real estate agent to show the property when the tenant is always asking for two days' notice before you bring a prospective buyer through the property. But let's keep it simple here. The landlord can knock on the door and ask permission to enter, and the tenant can give it, or the tenant can require the landlord to give them two days written notice to enter the premise.
Let's talk a little bit about breaches by the landlord. If the landlord breaches some of the terms and conditions for health and safety reasons, let's say, for example, it's summertime, it's 105 degrees out and the air conditioning breaks down. Well, the tenant has to notify the landlord that the air conditioning stopped working, but now the landlord doesn't take any action to correct this issue. And the tenant feels, hey, I've got to, I've got to terminate this thing, I've got to stop this lease. Even though the tenant might not want to terminate the lease and move out, because it's a health or safety issue, the tenant can notify the landlord in writing and say, look, if you don't fix this in five days, I'm terminating my lease. If it's for other reasons other than health or safety, then the tenant can terminate the lease after giving the landlord 10 days written notice. There's a provision in the Landlord Tenant Act which is referred to as self help for minor defects. You see a broken window there, or how about the toilet uh, keeps on running or the toilet won't flush for whatever reason. That's a relatively minor defect. That being the case, the tenant, of course, uh, has to notify the landlord, but the tenant, if the, once they notify the landlord that this problem exists and the landlord doesn't take action to fix it in a reasonable amount of time, then the tenant can actually hire a licensed contractor and as long as the charge is no more than $300 or half the month's rent, whichever is greater, the tenant can have that licensed contractor fix that minor defect. Again, the landlord has to be given notice. So the, the tenant cannot just go ahead and say, okay, the toilet's broken and call, and call a plumber in uh, and then tell the landlord, well, I'm reducing my rent by the $500 bill. If the landlord was not notified, the tenant has no right to do that. It's only after the landlord has been given notice and the landlord fails to take a reasonable action, a reasonable time, to a reasonable amount of time to go ahead and fix that minor defect. One of the questions that comes up is in a periodic tenancy, typically a month-to-month -month tenancy, when can the landlord give the tenant notice and when does that notice to terminate become effective? So let's take a situation in which the rent is due on the first of each month. By law, Landlord Tenant Act says that the landlord has to give the tenant or the tenant give the landlord at least 30 days notice. But that notice begins at the commencement or the start of the next rental period. For example, today is February 9th. And let's say the rent is due on the first of each month and I've paid the rent already for February. And the landlord comes in and says, Jim, I need you to leave. Here's your 30 days notice. Well, when does my 30 days begin? It doesn't begin until March 1st, and my time to vacating would be at the end of March. Because the February rental, rental period has already begun. I've already paid that rent. So the 30 days notice does not begin until March 1st, the beginning of the next rental period. Ooh, evictions. Well, sometimes uh, landlords evict tenants. And in this circumstance, I mean, the only one we're going to talk to, there's actually a, a long list of different reasons for eviction. But the most common one by far is the tenant hasn't paid the rent. In that circumstance, the landlord must give the tenant at least five days notice to cure the default, to pay the rent. And if not, then after that five days, the landlord can begin an eviction. Now remember, let's say the rent is due on the first of the month. If the fifth of the month comes, the landlord cannot at that point bring an eviction action because the landlord has not given the tenant any notice. So if the landlord does not receive the rent on the first, the five, until such time as they give that tenant five days notice, they cannot begin the eviction process. What happens if the tenant abandons the property and leaves some personal property behind? Furniture, the TV, whatever it else it is that the tenant might have. Well, the landlord has to be careful here. The landlord cannot just dispose of that. The landlord, by law, must hold that personal property for at least 10 days. After the 10 days, the landlord can actually dispose of it however they choose. They could throw it away. They could sell it. Uh, however, they must keep it for at least 10 days. And a smart landlord, if the tenant 
vacates the property, uh, not having paid the rent, of course. Now, remember, if the tenant has paid the rent, even though the tenant may seem to have abandoned the property, the tenant is still uh, a valid renter. So it's only after the tenant has failed to pay the rent, seems to have abandoned the property, that the landlord might go in there, find some personal property around, and if they if they feel that the tenant has abandoned the property, they're going to still have to hold that property for at least 10 days. What happens if someone is a victim of domestic violence? Well, in that particular situation, the law does allow the tenant to terminate that lease without any penalty. More commonly than not, of course, it's a woman who is the victim of domestic violence. She wants to get out of the property. She may want to go to a safe house. In that circumstance, she would be allowed to terminate the lease and there would be no penalty that the landlord could charge because of the fact she's a victim of, do of domestic violence. Sometimes landlords want to lock a tenant out of their property because they haven't paid the rent. Or the, ten the tenant has personal property in there, hasn't paid the rent, but clearly has not abandoned the property. So we're we're distinguishing here between a situation where the tenant has obviously abandoned the property, taken most of their stuff out, but left some things in there. In that circumstance, if the landlord feels the tenant has abandoned the property, then the landlord can enter the property, take that personal property, has to hold on to it for at least 10 days. That is not considered to be distraint. However, it's, let's say it's pretty obvious the tenant is still living in the property. The landlord cannot go in there and take out some of their personal property and say, if you don't pay me the rent, I'm going to keep this property, or until you pay me the rent, I'm not going to give it back to you. Nor can the landlord lock the tenant out. In residential property in Arizona, distraint is illegal. It's not illegal in commercial property, but in residential property, it is. What happens when the landlord and tenant have a dispute? Well, we have this Landlord-Tenant Act, this Landlord-Tenant Law. How do you resolve disputes? Well, they're resolved in court, and typically it's not Judge Judy or Judge Wapner. Right? It's typically done in what is called either small claims or more frequently justice court. It doesn't go to superior court, to high court. It, typically, these residential landlord-tenant disputes are resolved in justice court. If a landlord wants to evict a tenant, that's typically where they go. They go to justice court. So to resolve landlord-tenant disputes, typically we go to court. Ooh, bed bugs. What about them? Well, they're a common problem across the country. And some years ago, bed bug legislation was introduced into the Arizona Landlord-Tenant Act. And what the law says is that the landlord shall not enter into, in other words, can't enter into a lease agreement for a unit where there is known infestation. So the landlord would have to take care of that infestation before entering into a new lease with a tenant. And they have to provide tenants, this is in all cases now, they have to provide tenant with educational materials. So if you are a landlord, whether or not you have bed bugs now, you're supposed to be providing tenants with some written educational materials relative to bed bug infestation. Also, Tenants are not allowed to knowingly move in infested items. So if a tenant was aware of the fact that some of their furniture and so on or clothing was infested with bed bugs, they should not knowingly move that in. And the tenant has to notify the landlord of any infestation. So if a tenant finds the property or the building is infested with bed bugs, then they have to notify the landlord. Now, the law actually doesn't specify penalties for these things. So if the landlord uh, in, rented a unit to somebody that was infested or if a tenant knowingly moved things in, then the other party's remedy is simply to take them to court to try to recover some damages. Single family residences, single family detached residences are excluded from this bed bug provision in the law. Why? Because bed bugs typically migrate through walls from unit to unit. They don't cross over a 50-foot or 100-foot divide between the uh, two single-family houses. So where single-family residences are concerned, this bed bug legislation does not have any force and effect. Oh, yeah, one day I was driving down the street and there was some, all this old junk furniture out on the street, but fortunately the tenant who put it out there, or maybe it was the landlord, but I presume it was a tenant, actually had written this on this old mattress. So 
Those of you in particular that are young and in need of furniture and you're driving down the street and you see this nice couch or mattress sitting out there, uh, I would suggest you leave it alone because the chances are whoever put it out there is not going to be nice enough to have warned you that it's full of bed bugs. So that's our little discussion here on the Arizona Residential Landlord and Tenant Act. In this lesson, we're going to talk about property management and also planned communities. First off, property management. So who are the parties to a property management agreement? Well, they are the property owner, the investor, who owns that rental property, and the broker or brokerage firm. And they enter into a property management agreement. We're going to talk about those in just a minute. So please realize the property owner is the principal and the property manager is the agent. And the type of agency that's created here is called a general agency. Now, in another lesson, we talked about specific agency and general agency. A specific agency is the type that's entered into in a listing agreement where the owner hires the broker to sell the property. And the broker is given very limited authority just to show the property, market the property, and prepare and present offers. In a general agency under a property management agreement, the broker is hired to collect rent, to pay bills, to enter into leases with tenants and so on. So it's a much broader type of agency. Therefore, it's referred to as a general agency. So keep in mind in property management, the agency is a general agency. The broker is a general agent of the principal. And I want you to remember that the broker is the manager. Sometimes people get confused in property management situations. They think that the salesperson can actually manage the property outside of the realm of the brokerage company. Absolutely not true. Property management requires a broker's license, a brokerage company, right? and if a salesperson wants to manage property, they have to do so through the company. So the broker is the property manager. And he or she is a general agent, as I've already mentioned. And that manager has to be licensed if they're managing two or more properties. You might remember in one of the other lessons that we had, we talked about there's an exemption in the licensing law that says the manager of not more than one property may actually manage, receive compensation if they are not licensed. So aside from that exemption, if someone is managing two or more properties, whether for the same owner or for different owners, then they must be a licensed broker or a salesperson representing a broker in order to legally manage those properties. And a property manager has fiduciary duties. There's no difference between a seller client and a buyer client or an investor client, a landlord client, that when you manage those properties. So the property manager has fiduciary duties, the full slate of fiduciary duties to that client. One of the biggest ones, of course, since they're handling a lot of the client's monies, is accounting. Please keep in mind that the salesperson always represents the broker. What we're seeing in, in actual fact today is that some people don't think they need a license to do property management. So there are actually people who are unlicensed, acting outside the law, doing property management. Another thing that we're seeing is sometimes a salesperson has helped an investor buy five or ten or more properties. And that investor wants that salesperson to manage the properties. But the brokerage company the salesperson works for does not do property management. Yet that salesperson, just to keep that client satisfied, actually goes ahead and manages those properties on their own. That is clearly illegal. The management has to be done through the brokerage firm. So what are the concerns, the main concerns and duties of a property manager? Well, the main concern is to get the highest possible return, and that's net return for the owner not just bringing in the highest amount of rent, but keeping expenses down as low as possible. So the net income to the owner, that's the bottom line income. That's what the property manager should be trying to do is get the highest net return for the owner. As part of that, by the way, is to know the market 
and know where the, maybe the rent should be increased somewhat. Maybe the property manager should recommend some repairs or maintenance to the property, which even though they're going to cost some money, might allow that property to rent for a lot more, thereby increasing that net return. Another concern for a property manager, of course, is protecting the owner from risk. Insurance, of course, can minimize the, the owner's risk, but what about just inspecting the property, making sure that there's nothing that could cause some harm? For example, I one time was walking around my property here and I saw that the cover to one of the irrigation boxes had, was missing. Well, somebody could be walking by there, especially at night, not see that and put their foot in there and break their leg or break their ankle. So just good observation and making sure that there's nothing out there that might, uh, might harm a tenant or a passerby. Also making sure that the vendors, the people that, that the property manager might be contracting with, have sufficient insurance and are well qualified and where necessary are licensed contractors doing whatever work needs to be done. So aside from concerns, what are some of property manager's duties? Well, take a look at your course material. Pretty simply stated, they include collecting rents, leasing the units, advertising vacancies, keeping accounts, filing reports to the owner, maybe hiring employees in some larger properties, buying supplies, overseeing remodeling, a long list of things that a property manager might do for the owner. So what kind of recommendations might a property manager make to an owner? Well, certainly maintenance and repairs. How about insurance, making sure there's enough and sufficient insurance on the property? Maybe increasing the rent so they can uh, get that bottom line up a little bit. So a lot of duties and a lot of recommendations that property managers might make to the owner. Now the law specifically states certain things that must be in a property management agreement. Let's go through these. First of all, must contain all terms and conditions. Property management agreements have to be signed by all parties. They have to have a beginning and an ending date. There can be, and there has to be, a cancellation provision in a property management agreement. The law doesn't say what that must be, but it must give the landlord and the property manager the ability to cancel in some way, shape, or form. Disposition of funds, how monies are going to be handled, have to be included in the property management agreement. Status reports, how frequently will status reports be made to the owner? Typically, it's done monthly. What's the amount of that's set aside for and the purpose of reserve? So are you putting money aside to make sure that when needed, the roof can be fixed or that the air conditioning or heating units can be taken care of? As a landlord, you want to make sure your property is in good shape. As a property manager, you want to make sure that there's money available that maybe you set it aside so that you don't have to keep on going to the landlord and asking them for money. It's a lot easier to set it aside with the landlord's knowledge and consent, of course, so that you have that money available to do the repairs when necessary. What about interest? Well, the law allows landlords to collect interest on property management trust accounts. So who's going to get that interest? Well, in most instances, brokerage firms say, well, the interest is going to go to the brokerage firm. Also, the property management agreement must specify how the broker and how much the broker will be compensated. Also, property management agreements cannot be assigned to another property management company without the express written permission of the property owner. So just like listings and buyer broker agreements, they're employment contracts and they cannot be assigned to a third party without the other party's consent. Also, property management accounts. Property management accounts must be trust accounts. Question, who can sign on these property management trust accounts? The answer is the designated broker can, or a licensee with the company, also an employee such as a bookkeeper. And it has to be an employee in the direct employee of the broker. So those three persons can sign on a property management trust account. Property owner, however, cannot sign on trust accounts. So even if you manage a series of properties owned by one owner and yet and the rents and other monies go into trust accounts, the property owner, even though they're all just that one owner's properties, cannot 
cannot sign on that trust account, cannot have access to that trust account. Nor, by the way, can a broker have access to a client's account. So in other words, sometimes in a rare circumstance, a client says, well, deposit all the money into my personal account for me. Well, the broker can do that, but the broker cannot have access to that account. What about record keeping on property management accounts? Well, first of all, for residential property management, leasers and things relating to finder's fees, which we'll talk about in a minute, have to be kept for one year. Financial records have to be kept for three years. So these are a little different than the five years that we talked about when we talked about general record keeping for brokers. Residential property management has some special time periods. Commercial property, similar to regular brokerage listings and sales, five years. All records have to be kept for five years. If there is a termination of a property management agreement, what the law requires is that within five days, the property manager has to give the landlord a list of all security deposits. Within 35 days, they have to reimburse all monies that have to be reimbursed. Within 75 days, provide a final accounts receivable and payable list, and within that same 75 days, a final reconciliation of the property management account. So those are required when a property management agreement is terminated. So what about these finder's fees that I mentioned? Well, in a very special circumstance, if you have an apartment building, uh, and the tenants, of course, are unlicensed. Most of them are, and all of them are probably unlicensed. They're not licensed real estate agents. You can pay them a finder fee. It can't be cash, but it can be a rent reduction or a rent credit. So if they invite their friends or relatives to come in and maybe rent one of the apartments in that complex, the landlord or the property manager can pay that tenant. Even though they're not licensed as a real estate agent, they can pay them a finder fee. No limit on the amount, no limit on the amount of times it can be done, but it has to be a rent credit or rent reduction. So that's our discussion on property management. In the next lesson, we're going to get into and talk about HOAs, in other words, planned communities.